Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Vanessa. I'm from Patuani Hini Attorneys, and I will be your host for today. Welcome to this, the second in this year's New Breed Art webinar series, uh, presented by Patuani Hini Attorneys and proudly sponsored by APSA. Today, we welcome well-known Cape Town sculptor Ben Orkin. Um, he will be interviewed by Miro van der Vloot, uh, who is a member of the Free State Art Collective, as well as the 2021 New Breed Art Competition Merit Award winner. Uh, so without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Miro. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's such an honor to be here and to be chatting to Ben. Um, so I thought I would start by just briefly introducing Ben. Um, I guess it's already been said that he's a sculptor based in Cape Town. And I was lucky enough to study with him at Michaelis and we both graduated in 2020. Uh, I really relate to his work on a personal level because it um, has to do with queer intimacy. And it's something that I also explore in my own practice. So it really is great to be chatting to him today. Um, and apart from being such a like prolific emerging artist, he's also someone that I can call a friend and I've gotten to know his like kindness and his um, sensitivity over the last year and a half. So yeah, I'm very grateful for that. Um, yeah, so onto his uh, last uh, few exhibitions. In 2019, he presented his first solo show with What If The World Gallery entitled You Told Me. And in 2021, he showed um, another body of work with What If The World um, entitled Extra Safe. Um, apart from that, he also participated in a few group shows as well throughout the years. Um, so it, with regards to Extra Safe, the show, um, I really think that its themes spoke so, and what it spoke to um, was so relevant for today as the safety of queer folk um, around the world are being threatened. Um, both in like a historical and a contemporary context. So um, going from like persistent uh, discrimination that HIV positive members um, of the queer community still have to contend with um, on a global scale, as well as like in a South African context. Um, and then going through to like the COVID-19 pandemic that severely affected almost everyone in our like daily lives, but in particular, um, it financially impacted queer individuals and especially people of color. Um, so that was something that we've all needed to contend with in the last like two years. But um, now in the, the more recent, the uncertainty of the last few years has really been made more turb turbulent by the monkey pox outbreak. And the media narrative around it is unfortunately very similar to the, um, the way that the narrative formed around the HIV AIDS crisis in the beginning, um, where it was labeled as diseases that mainly or only affected queer individuals, um, which is something that through social media, hopefully can, uh, the correct information can be spread and um, awareness can be raised for the fact that it does affect everyone. Um, and so that it doesn't just negatively impact the queer community, like queer people. Um, so I would like to start by uh, sharing my screen now. Um, let me just go here. Okay. Because uh, I'd like to show some images from the Extra Safe show that Ben, um, let me see here. Okay. There we go. So having given a more general overview of queer safety, I'd like to know from Ben what inspired um, this conceptualization of extra safe and what the idea of safety means to you. Thank you, Mero, and thank you so much for the beautiful introduction. That was really <laughs> helpful and kind. Of, um, and also thank you for hosting me on this interview. Of no? um, so, this is half of what you can see on the screen is half of my solo show Extra Safe. And the title of that show came from a type of condom that's produced by Durex called Extra Safe. And these condoms um, 
provide extra protection and safety during intimacy. And I was kind of, when I saw these, this type of condom, I kind of questioned or thought like, what does, what does safety mean in relation to um, queer intimacy? And particularly mm -hmm. in relation to the AIDS epidemic in the 80s and kind of like what the effect that's had on gay identities and queer identities today. So um, I, I was confronted with HIV actually, and I felt that the only way I could kind of deal with it was by looking backwards in the past and almost finding um, like a community story or something that, that made, made the feeling bigger or belonging to something more. Mm -hmm. um, which is why I looked back into the past at the AIDS epidemic. Um, and that was a very interesting process for me. So I was kind of thinking around barriers, specifically looking at the condom as like a barrier between two partners and that one can't pass onto the other. So that being a very physical barrier and, and the fear around that. And then thinking about the barrier between um, partners, but then also thinking about the barriers between yourself and the community that you belong to. And then finally thinking about the barriers between the community of the present that you that you are part of, and then the community of the past and, and like the differences. And during my research, I came across this writer who's a um, clinical psychologist, his name's Walter Detz, mm -hmm. and he defined these three generations that exist or yeah, exist as the queer community today. Um, so he said that there's the older generation, which is um, men who lived through the epidemic itself in the 80s, but they were also sexually active in the 70s during the sexual liberation movement when, when sexuality was more free and um, people were more accepting. But then almost the result of that was the AIDS epidemic, which was kind of posed as this punishment for, for gay sex. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the older generation. And a lot of them, unfortunately, passed away during the epidemic. Then the next generation is the middle group who, um, who were children when the epidemic happened. So they witnessed, um, they witnessed the suffering to a community who they would one day belong to. And so when mm -hmm. they eventually become part of that community, they kind of carry all those fears and the, and the trauma of observing and seeing the suffering. And then there's the final generation, which is our generation, the, the young group who mm -hmm. are completely separate from the epidemic itself and almost living like the older group lived before the AIDS epidemic with the sexual liberation movement, thanks to um, so many medical advances and information Absolutely. around how to be safe during sex. So um, it's kind of given us this ability to be more free and, and do, do things with, with some knowledge, but also there's a little bit of like an in ignorance for what's happened in the past and kind of not carrying that trauma with you because then it means you have to deal with like everything that everyone says about your queerness. Absolutely. I think it's difficult to um, put ourselves in the position that you, like you mentioned, the older generations, we didn't live, we didn't have those as our lived experiences. So it's really hard to relate to those. And I guess we can learn from older generations and the stories that they have and their life lived experience can serve as like a, a, um, a much a, like a base of, to base our own like experiences on. But um, like we, like you said, you can't really, um, you can be almost like nonchalant about it because we didn't have the same kind of media as well. The media narrative, I think, also played a big part into um, the fear and the miscommunication of misinformation that was being spread. So I think now that it's largely been destigmatized, has made a big impact on how we view HIV and other STIs, yeah. um, as well as like 
have it, like having the knowledge about how to have safer sex is also so important. And um, I think we're very lucky to live in this generation, you know, of the three generations that we get to experience this is quite, um, yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, cool. So this, as Ben mentioned, this was the first half of his show. Um, so I'll now go to the, this is an image of the other, would this be the other half of the yeah, work? That you're second half. Okay, cool. So and, the first uh, half I produced during my fourth year at university as my mm -hmm. like, exhibition. And then this half that you're seeing now I produced the year afterwards. Perfect. And um, I do love, all of the pieces are so amazing, but I do would like to just focus on this one in particular. And um, it's entitled How to Have Sex in an Epidemic One Approach. And um, I'd love to have you like elaborate on the relationship between the ceramic pieces and how their interconnectedness speaks to both a historical and a contemporary context, if you could. Sure. So this piece, like Nero said, is titled How to Have Sex in an Epidemic One Approach. And that title is borrowed from one of the first safe sex manuals that was written in 1981 by um, Michael Callan and Richard Berkowitz. And because um, it was written in New York, because the government in America wasn't doing anything to, to mm. help the gays, basically, um, and they wouldn't even acknowledge that there was an epidemic. The gay community kind of had to had to help itself in a way, or had to produce something based on the findings that they they could read mm -hmm. um, to 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 ensure that people could protect themselves and be safe. So this this pamphlet was written, and what I enjoyed about it was how it almost became like this gay bible in a way because it outlined the rules and the ethics of behavior how you should behave in a community but it was also kind of like a story of creation which is what a, mm -hmm. what the bible is because mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of people actually came together in the gay community during this time to kind of like fight against all the misinformation and all the stigmas that were being put on gay identities. So some people might say that the epidemic kind of brought the community together in a stronger way, which I think is a beautiful image, even though it was mm -hmm. so horrible and there was so much suffering and death. But so I kind of took that thinking and this pamphlet and kind of imagined this community um, how how this community interacted with each other and how everyone was linked to each other in this chain like uh -huh. image which is what you see here in this piece so it's basically i think it's 37 individual pieces that i built um one after the other and they all kind of slot into each other or um a protrusion from the one fills the whole of another or they kind of like hug each other. So they all are mm -hmm. kind of linked to each other, creating this chain. And it's almost like this virus spreading from one person to the next and linking back onto itself. Um, yeah. And my, um, my form that I create, mm -hmm. it's kind of been expanded, but the, the beginnings or the, the initial thinkings was kind of creating forms that represented um, gay intimacy. So looking at how um, bodies kind of reflected each okay. other, which is why everything is symmetrical. But I would kind of simplify these intimate experiences into these symbols mm -hmm. in a way, which is what you see here. And they almost become like an alphabet. And then when you put them together, it kind of makes a sentence or something. Mm -hmm. But I've kind of expanded on, on that thinking like as I develop my work slowly. I really like what you were saying about um it's like a creation myth and um or like a you know myth myth yeah mythology yeah. of creation. And um I was doing a lot of research into like queer utopias and queer imagining. So I think that like coming together as a community and having the ability to imagine a future or like a, a space that um is safe and um where 
your the members who belong to their community can act in a certain way like those kind of rules i think were very instrumental to I, I don't know, creating a safe space for queer people during that time, because obviously the world didn't have any rules, like there was only yeah. just there was only like hatred and bigotry and there were so many negative things impacting queer individuals that it seems like such an um, a positive force to come together to create like this new thing. So I, I can imagine that I would have I would love to go and have a look at the um, the document you were inspired by I think that's really cool yeah and also you're like um saying that it's like an alphabet uh language is also something that's so fluid and um can change over time and I really like the fluidity of language and how certain words can change their meanings and um can have such a big impact on like future generations so I think by creating these like symbols or forms that um speak to language i really think that that um is quite significant especially because um like reclaiming words that were used as like discriminatory in the gay community um you can like take words that once were quite like harmful and filled with like hate and you can like transform them and i think your pieces are very transformative in that way um so yeah i really love this and on the this piece specifically um we were just talking about form and them reflecting each other mm. and i was just wondering um how you like conceptualize them um did you sketch out the shapes or did you make maquettes or did you just start and see where the process took you um this piece was actually quite a challenge i quite i mm. tried to make it a few times and it didn't quite work sure um, so I, like I said, I, each piece informed the next one. So I didn't sketch each individual piece, but what I did was start with one shape mm -hmm. and then kind of um, like figure out how, how someone or something would interact with that form okay. in a connection point. So they all, like I said, they all connect to each other, but they actually don't touch, which is mm -hmm. also interesting. Um, they all kind of slot into each other in different ways. But what, like I said, how I've kind of expanded my thinking around form and creating these symbols that reflect gay intimacy, I've kind of taken that um, language and expanded on it in a different way by making shapes that have actions in a way. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what you see here, there's a lot of spikes. So. I like to think how the spike is uh, like pushing something away. It's like a protective force, but it also, if you look at the HIV virus microscopically, it's got these little fingers, which mm -hmm. actually like cling onto different cells in your body. So it's kind of, it brings all these different things I was thinking about and looking at into these, into these shapes in a way. Yeah. Also, con like you started conceptualizing this, was this before the COVID pandemic hit? Yeah. Or was oh, wow. Yeah. So I think it obviously it just became so double layered in so many yeah. ways. Like speaking about the virus and barriers, it's really amazing that the work came to be it's in this time where, you know, it had so much meaning. Yeah. Um, cool. And then I'm just going to go back to this previous image. These colors that you use are very like almost gearish and like um, artificial. And um, you contrast that with very natural like clay um, shades. And I was just wondering, um, I've heard you speak about glazing your work um, in relation to the concept of safety and like creating a barrier between the work and the viewer. And I really thought that was super interesting because um, I've always thought of glazing as just, um, you know, a means to make the the um, ceramic vessel like waterproof and protected from the elements and from dirt. So I never thought of it as like a conceptual element. Um, so I'd really like to know a bit more about that, if you could tell us. Yeah, that's actually interesting because I also hadn't thought about it before. Mm -hmm. but I think because ceramics is such an established medium, you kind of take take the process or the material for granted and you you just kind of 
you would just blaze a piece because that's what ceramicists do. Absolutely. Like, yeah. When I was working on this exhibition, I really thought about why am I glazing or what what does glazing mean? Mm -hmm. And so what I what I realized, and also this was through um, working with the lecturers at, at university, they kind of reminded me of something, but um, the glaze is like the condom on the clay. It's like mm -hmm. the, the barrier that protects the clay body, which is porous from any kind of outside infection. So that's why choosing to have glaze was very intentional. And mm -hmm. then I, I kind of thought about that more and thought that the glaze is like an artificial, it's not the natural state of the clay. And so I played with that by, in this image, you can see there's three pieces on the left side that are completely unglazed. And then there's, yeah, exactly. And then on the other side, on the right side, those two smaller pieces are, mm -hmm. it's the same clay, but with a clear glaze. So, okay. and then others are like colored glazes. But um, what I was trying to kind of say is, again, like the, the glaze is artificial. So um, I, would, I would show these very like bright garish colors next to these natural colors to kind of push the idea that the glaze is not, it's not natural. And so the barrier, it's not, it's not natural state of how the, the clay should be. But then I also kind of liked to think about the, the brighter colors because they sit in a kind of similar tonal range, but they're not really like the yellow. It's, mm -hmm. it's almost like this greeny yellow that's quite shocking. Yeah. So that color, it's almost like the, the dragged up version of. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> yeah. So again, just to point to the fact that it's it's artificial and it's it's a barrier on the mm -hmm. And I also like how in relation to the other pieces, it's just something that I thought about now that these colors, like color, uh, vibrant colors are like synonymous with like the pride flag and like, you know, um, I guess mm -hmm. queerness is just like bright, like standout colors and um, having the like very neutral or natural tone clay in relation to it, it almost creates like an like an otherness or like you see them even yeah. they stand out more because they're in relation to these like very um, natural shades. And I think that that's an interesting conversation because it's not something that is seen in a, like a negative light. It's almost like they're being celebrated because they are so bright and like they're just standing out. And I really like how that into you know interplay between like are they othered are they being celebrated mm -hmm. um is there um especially in relation to the i guess the aids crisis where being othered was a tool that was used to like um you know subjugate and discriminate so yeah. i think that's really an interesting like thing and i didn't realize that the um objects that this uh ooh, these sculptures were the same clay as this just with a clear glaze is that what you were saying yeah because exactly. they're so different it's really amazing to to think that that's like the same thing so um yeah also yeah the shape of this right one just reminded me of the next question so um ceramic vessels as referential to the body is a theme that we both um explore in our work and um i was just wondering how this way of thinking might have impacted your view on the materiality of clay and the intimate relationship between the maker and object. Because I've seen you work and like it's a very hands on because mm. you're building such big pieces and like layering on top. It's amazing to think how much time you actually spend like touching clay. So if you could tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so maybe I should first say how I make all my forms. Um, mm. Mm -hmm. by hand like you said with coils yeah. so that that's a process of almost rolling sausages with clay and then stacking mm -hmm. them on top of each other and smoothing them together to create like a wall which which then depending on the shape creates the vessel form so that's everything yeah. and you can see actually in this image the piece on the right it has these like spiral shapes 
that's the that shape is actually like a coil in a way so yes i just kind of inverted the coil in the other mm -hmm. direction but um i think that clay is one of the most um human materials um mm -hmm. it's like even if you think about one of the earliest stories of creation from the bible man was made from earth which is clay mm -hmm. and also the idea that man after he dies returns to the earth and mm -hmm. his body becomes earth um so in that way we are earth if you believe in that um but then also thinking about how i think of clay like bones in a way because when i'm building a form it's it's got the structure but it's also very wet and vulnerable yeah. and when bones are inside your body they they give your body support and structure, but they also soft because if you break a bone, um, it, it's able to heal itself because it's fluid. So it kind of fixes itself with fluid. Mm -hmm. So that's that. And then when you fire clay, it becomes hard like stone and it, it actually is like permanent in that state, state. It can never return back to mm -hmm. being wet or malleable. Um, and then when bones are, when your body is just bones, basically, and mm -hmm. your, your bones are exposed, they become hard, also like stones. And a lot of like, sometimes when you see um, ancient tombs being exposed, you'll see someone's bones remain and also like a ceramic pot. And they've both, mm -hmm. they've both lasted thousands of years. So in that way, I think, ceramics is very close to bones um yeah bones oh, and humans. like that and i also think that the vulnerability i think when you were talking about you know bones being outside of the body and also ceramic pieces after they're fired there's a kind of fragility or like um you know you need to almost look after these objects because like your bone your bones can't heal once you are just left with you know once your body's decomposed so i think that that idea of vulnerability is also there like to the bone or like to the core of something being into like a, a vulnerable space so i think having fired ceramics also because when you work with um unfired ceramics it's it's even more precious and yes. uh, vulnerable but then you can fix it it's very easy to to like fix a crack or like to like add a little bit of clay here and there but once it's fired it's almost like a, it, like you said in a permanent state you can't change it but it can still break and yeah um, that's also the thing it's like when you when you work with ceramics or you are a ceramicist you're almost creating these frozen moments in time mm -hmm. and each form once it's fired that moment is complete yeah and my forms are quite static and a little bit dead in a way like they don't have movement because mm. i like to think about that being like a static gotcha. moment that's passed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the um, this form in the back is very interesting and it's going to lead into um, la a later question. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask as well, we, you, we graduated in 2020 and um, when you presented this other body, of, uh, this body of work um, with What If The World, that was just the following year. Um, so I definitely know how much goes into building an art career and it's not an easy thing to do. And I just like to hear your thoughts on like gallery representation and whether you're striving for recognition from others or do you just create because you love it and you love clay and you love making things? Because I think that's something that we've had a chat about that I'd like to yeah. hear your opinion. Um, first, I would say it's never for others. I mm -hmm. mean, it, no, it is for others, but not the not for others recognition it's maybe for mm -hmm. others more like for a community you know yes like I this part of work was to like a like a gift to or a thinking around how a community yeah. is but yeah so it's never for others to you know raise you or like yeah yeah, exactly. yeah um but it was to be with the gallery it was quite a um like a long process mm -hmm. And I didn't actually intend to 
I didn't see myself um, like when I started making ceramics, I didn't see the end vision of being with a gallery. I just was making because that's mm -hmm. what I have to do. But I um, I started showing my work in like different retail stores in Cape Town, mm -hmm. and like a clothing store or a craft store. Um, and slowly and also kind of like meeting other artists at the same time and meeting different people going to different openings um, and like associating myself with the art community in Cape Town. And then yeah. slowly my work became more known. And then I had an opportunity to show with What If The World, which was, I was like amazed because I, I really am, when I walk into the gallery, I'm so proud to have my work shown with such amazing artists. And mm. the What If The World team are so kind and generous to me and they've only supported my career, which is amazing. Yeah. So it was like a slow process, but now I'm showing with them. Amazing. I definitely am such a fan girl for um, What If The World gallery. I think they've always like shown such great work and, um, I think a lot of people from Michaela's who I've seen like also show with them and like there's just so many people that have amazing work and it's amazing it's so great to see it in a space that is so close to us like geographically and then that we mm -hmm. just get to like support our friends and people that we've kind of seen um during our time at Michaela's yeah show there so it is really awesome um and I think now we can move on to so we've chatted about this show that happened in Cape Town and um, this last year you've been very busy and uh, you have done a oh sorry this is just a close-up of the the one um, you are currently doing a art residency at Gemunder uh, Keramik which is in Vienna if I'm not in mistaken Austria, in Austria in Austria and in, Austria, um, in a town called Gemunden and yes. the factory that I'm working in is Called yes. ceramic. and um i just think it's amazing that one the world's like started opening up again and you know after all the heavy travel restrictions we get to like experience amazing things like this and um i guess chat about your experiences of that so i'd really like to just briefly hear about the residency how it was over the last i think it was two months that you've been there and you're about to come back to south africa yeah. So I'd love to know what what went on and um, I can show some photos of that. Um, here we go, of some of the work that we have. <laughs> uh, that uh, you were there. Um, yes, yes, I'm still I'm still in Austria mm -hmm. and I'm actually coming back to South Africa on Sunday. But this was my first ever residency, which was incredible. I think mm -hmm. for ceramicists, it's a little bit more tricky to find a residency because you need a lot of time mm -hmm. and so the facilities, not everyone has kilns. I was about to say access to facilities is such, such a big thing. So. Yeah. so I'm currently working in a factory called Kumunda Ceramic, like I said, which was founded mm -hmm. in 1492. So it has a very long history. Wow. Mm -hmm. And... Um, throughout their history, they've always had artists working in the factory, but that kind of fell away in the nineties and now they're trying to reintroduce that project. Um, mm. So they've invited a few different artists. I'm the only one that's not from Europe actually, okay. but next year they'll have some more South African artists coming. Um, but that's actually a, like a funny story. So the Western Cape, is um, a cousin or like a yeah like a province cousin to the mm -hmm. area in in Austria which I didn't know when I arrived um, so they invited me and I've been working here for two months and I made a few big pieces and another piece actually um, like how to have sex in an epidemic one approach mm -hmm. in a slightly different way and yeah, that's been my time. It's been amazing. Mm. I've, I've been able to make really big work because they have massive kilns. And yeah, let me quickly show this massive kiln. There it is. <laughs> so it is 
something to behold. I think as a ceramicist myself, I'm used to firing in my mom's um, kiln, which is probably a tiny fraction of one of these kilns. So it's mm, really I'm also used to firing in my mom's kiln. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah. yeah. So this, just for scale, this piece is like my height. Yes, I've got an image here of Ben standing next to it. So there oh, he is. <laughs> And um, I'd love to like know about, um, so we were just talking about the size of the kilns and do you enjoy working in a more modular way or do you think that the single piece approach is something that you prefer now that you've done it in the uh, with the big kilns? So, so when I started making, actually when I was given the opportunity to show with What If The World, they wanted bigger work. Yeah. And I wasn't sure how I would do that because I didn't actually want to make modular pieces because I wanted everything to be singular. Mm -hmm. um, but but I did it and I, I did more and more of it and slowly I've kind of developed that into another language because my work is about relationships. So it's actually interesting that a lot of the forms are made in parts and, and mm -hmm. the way they slot together becomes like a relationship. But I always wanted to make really big work in one piece, which mm -hmm. is what I was able to do here, and which is this piece here, this orange terracotta looking Amazing. piece. Amazing. So it's all one singular piece. Mm -hmm. And um, just speaking about the relationships being part of it, the modularity, I also think that like community, because I think community is also another big aspect for you. And um, all of these smaller pieces coming together again just re-emphasizes re that. So I think that's um, a really cool way of working to have the the singular pieces coming together. But I'm glad that you got to you know live your dreams and make your huge uh, single piece. Um, and if you could give us some context on this work, it's called "This Is a Family Home," which I think has a lot of. It's a, a very interesting title to me, and I just wondered. Um, like how it came about or what your thinking was around it? Um, so this piece is is kind of based off another piece that I made for Extra Safe. Mm -hmm. I'll um, actually show it quickly. Of one of those pictures, that one, yeah. This is the one. And this one, you can see it's made in two parts because my yeah. piece is smaller at home. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it's kind of imagining this community. If you can see like this, these arms that kind of extend and support each other to create this almost yes, like a yes. or like a mm -hmm. protective space. So that was the, the first piece. And then I made this one during my residency. Mm -hmm. And the title actually comes from something that a family member said. Um, someone, someone had a, someone wanted, uh, someone gay wanted their partner to come to this family member's house. Mm -hmm. day and the family member said no this is there was she had different reasons but she basically said no this is a family home and wow. I just thought that was such a crazy thing to say because what does that actually mean and mm -hmm. also actually during the AIDS epidemic in Britain there was a law that was written that said something about um it basically said you can't educate people about AIDS in relation to gayness. And it also yeah. said, so you basically couldn't educate anyone on AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, and it also said something about um, that gays are not, cannot be families or, or like gays are like a pretend family or something like that. So I was kind of thinking about all of this in relation to family and then mm -hmm. also thinking what family means in the queer community and your chosen family and like all culture and how there's a mother and then the mother has children who represent her in the balls or whatever so mm -hmm. i was kind of thinking about that and creating this safe space which is like a community that hugs its itself mm -hmm. but then it also Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, no, no. Okay. I was just going to say that it, the shape, when you said them like holding hands, it reminds me of those um, almost like paper cutouts uh, that you make with like oh, yeah. for holding hands. And then that also reminded me of like Keith Haring's work and how, yeah. and I think that's such an amazing link back to the AIDS crisis and um, like having a very functional 2D 
repetition and you've just like extended it i guess into the 3d yeah. um and it's really amazing to see them like when you actually because i obviously needing like having the context now it makes so much sense to see these like people holding hands or like bodies merging into one um also they look like crosses to yeah me, there's like uh it looks like a bunch of crucifixes that are kind of stacked on top of each other which i also think is an interesting right. thing <laughs> Um, so I was going to say that when I was here, there was an mm -hmm. artist I discovered um, who I who I completely like fell in love with his work, and he mm -hmm. actually used to work in this factory that I'm working in. Yeah, he was like one of the artists mm -hmm. that, that worked in this space, and his name is um, Franz Joseph Altenberg, and mm -hmm. he basically created these ceramic like structures that represented buildings and towers and infrastructure which is something that i've been thinking about for another body of work but i just mm -hmm. found it's his work so interesting and he he made work that looked something like this but in a different way yeah. and actually a few of the things that i've made i've seen that he's made something similar which has been very strange not in like a, that I'm copying him way, but yeah, like yeah. later on, something similar. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that was that. And that kind of informed how I, I thought about this piece, even though it was something I'd made before, it kind of like re-inspired me to make it in a different way. Okay. And um, I'm sure there were many, many like memorable moments, but are there anything, was there anything in particular that you feel like impacted your thinking around ceramics as a medium of art production, like something that will stay with you? I would say this artist that I've discovered. Mm -hmm. was, okay. That's been incredible because I, I usually don't look at other artists' work mm -hmm. um, or other artists who work in similar ways to me. I do, I do look at... Um, other artists and think about the themes that they're thinking about or you know yeah I see. um but yeah that was quite incredible cool and there's this topic that i we are really am quite passionate about but the fact that um ceramics is like finally taking its place among the, like the other fine art mediums yeah um and like the art canon and how it's definitely long overdue um I think the fact that you showed work at the Milan Art Fair earlier this year really like inspired me. And also I'm sure there are young emerging ceramicists who also would really, you know, be inspired by the fact that you got to show in such a like international, like in the in international arena. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering if, yeah, you've just mentioned this person that um, who inspired you, but was there anyone at the Milan Art Fair that you saw? It doesn't have to be a ceramicist, but just someone that maybe stuck with you or um, you could, yeah, if you have someone. That... Um, there was an artist that was showing. He's not actually the, Mil the Me Art Art Fair. Mm -hmm. A lot of the work that's shown is like very established and dead artists. Okay kind of interesting to see but there was one artist they were showing um his name's larry stanton and he lived actually during the aids epidemic in the 80s in new york mm -hmm. and um he created these drawings and paintings of different men that he interacted with in the community okay. um, and they're very beautiful and um david hockney was one of his like supporters but his work wasn't really celebrated or seen until now. And there was this one booth that had a few of his works, which were just really beautiful and very sensitive. And they were telling me all about him. And it was very interesting. Amazing. Um, I just realized that we kind of skipped over all the cool photos of you building this ah. piece, <laughs> which I'd love to show. Um, so this was the first one that I had shown. But um, there you are in a full stool, <laughs> just like building up, I'm sure. Um, it was quite a feat to get to the top, like, mm -hmm. and this is one of my favorite images. I was telling Ben earlier, it looks like a, he's like a hermit crab. It's like crawling back into a shell or coming out of a shell. Um, and what were you, you were spraying it, right? With yes, the, um, I was using like, it with a brush, which I yeah. haven't used before, but it mm -hmm. was 
actually impossible to reach inside the the piece with a brush so i had to airbrush use that gun yeah and um so you used the colored glaze right so it was like the bright the yeah. orange terracotta color that you just sprayed on that's yeah, yeah. that's another uh, thing that's been incredible here um there's a whole um like there's a whole team of technical staff basically mm -hmm. and i can ask them i want this specific color in a glaze yeah you were there's possible. another image here so these yeah, are like, like some of the glazes you had developed with them examples but sure. it was it's been incredible like mm -hmm. anything that i need they've provided which is sure. a blessing that is amazing um okay and then there was also so these ones you were also busy with yes. um yeah so these other two pieces were also shown um I'm sure there are you like you mentioned you have some upcoming you know ideas about things to come but I was just wondering if there's anything you'd like to share with us any projects that you'd like to mention um because I'd love to know what's next <laughs> for you um I don't necessarily have any future plans mm -hmm. but I have ideas for my next body of work that I want to make and cool. they're kind of just like floating around in my head and I haven't brought them quite together yet but I but I want to explore making those kinds of new works when I get back home to Cape Town. Awesome. And um, lastly, I'd like to show off and may probably make a few people jealous, but um, this is just the scene scenery that Ben has been showing me while he was in um, at the residency. And I just think it's so yeah, breathtaking. And so that, just... that image is actually um, this lake called Monsi, which means moon this, lake. This one. Yeah. And yeah. You can't quite see the color, but it it was this bright blue, beautiful water. Mm -hmm. But um this I went on a tour in this town called Salzburg, which is where the sound of music was filmed. And this was oh. on the tour. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was crazy. That is amazing. I think that's uh very yeah, it's like beyond picturesque and i can imagine if sound of music it was shot there that it was insane to be uh, to experience yeah. it in real life yeah um and yeah so there was just i think being surrounded by so much like natural beauty might also play a part in like your future projects i think the color of the water would be when i saw it i was like this is a really nice like glaze inspiration that, that's what i did actually oh really three amazing the pieces, like three of the pieces i made Mm -hmm. are the colors of three different lakes that I've seen. So there's a green, uh, mm -hmm. blue, and a, like an aqua turquoise color. Amazing. That's so awesome. And then was this the same lake? This is a different lake called Trouncy, okay. which is the lake I'm staying on. It's, it's green, but you can't see it here. <laughs> awesome. Cool. I think that is all from my side. Let me just unshare my screen. Um, stop. Stop. Go back here. Cool. Um, I would like to now give the opportunity to the audience for any questions or comments. So um, you can feel free to put up your hand in the comment section, I think, and then we'll unmute you from there. Cool. Yes, um, you're also welcome to post your question in the chat. I see we do have a question already. Uh, let's see here from Vanessa. <laughs> you have a nice mm -hmm. name. Um, hi, Ben. Mm -hmm. In terms of glazes, how do you go about picking colors for your pieces? Hi, Vanessa. Um, thank you for the question. Um, so like I, I spoke about earlier um, with my last body of work, I wanted the glazes to... Um, to kind of reference the color of natural clay, but some of them to like push beyond, beyond that color. But when I'm working on a body of work, I think because my forms are all very um, like different looking, it's important that they all sit in a similar color or tonal range so that, that it's not too like fighting or too competitive. But in terms of choosing color, I would say that the work actually chooses the color itself like some some shapes want to be louder with with brighter colors some shapes want mm -hmm. to be more subdued with 
with softer or natural colors. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Ben. I see we have another question in the chat. And everyone, you're also welcome to use the raise your hand function and just pop up your hand and we will unmute you and you can also ask a question. Um, let's see, Luke wants to know, hi, Miro and Ben, you are both queer cer ceramicists. Do you see the medium itself through a queer lens or is it simply something you are drawn to? Ben, would you like to go um, first? Um, no, you can go, actually. Shucks, thanks. <laughs> I think um, there are a lot of like readings that I've done um, that have to do with not so much ceramics, uh, ceramics in particular, but like um, queer theory, queer theorists that I think are very interesting. And I think naturally I just related to ceramics because that's the medium that I'm most comfortable in. And I think Ben has also spoken about this where it's like, um, it's difficult conversations that you have with the medium that you're comfortable with and I think I feel the same way yeah that like um for me it's hard to talk about things particular things like if it's very personal or if it's something that ha that's quite difficult um that's I'm going through it's almost like the easiest thing to do it through clay because I Ben and I both have um ceramicists as mothers and we've grown up around clay <laughs> and it's been something that's quite like nurturing and I think um comforting so um that's i think why ceramics is my chosen medium to talk about you know queer issues um so i'm not sure i don't know if i answered ben's side as well but if you can you're you more basically than you basically <laughs> yeah we both have ceramics mothers mm -hmm. and they both like our teachers and but then it's also interesting because some of these conversations are not so comfortable to have with family but then yeah. you're working with a medium which is related to your family, which is also special because then you can communicate with a with the material that your family member understands. Yeah. No, that is well put, I think. Um, I've definitely experienced a similar thing. Um, and but there are, I'm sure there are ways that clay is um, queer related, like mm -hmm. Hilton Nell's work is. He's one of my favorite artists also, a South, Afri a South African ceramicist. And he mm -hmm. speaks a lot around queer issues with like illustrations. But maybe that, that in itself is something because traditionally um, people would kind of illustrate stories on plates that represent their town or their community. Mm -hmm. um, but it was usually like, in a conservative way so as a queer artist to work with clay is kind of like challenging that that narrative absolutely and I also think the actual material of clay um, I have a lot of fun um, and it's quite important to me to be able to almost splice or transform objects from their original use to like a new way of like in, like reimagining an object and I think with clay being so malleable it's very easy to take something that you know was set out to exist in a certain way and then to change it yeah. and i think in that way it's not a very permanent or fixed thing and i'd like how um ideologies and beliefs and kind of things that have held us back for so many generations can change and clay is almost like an allegory for that or like a, a way to you know represent that so um things can just be like change and i i also Made, it just had me thinking about people working with clay for the first time they're so scared of it and they just like barely want to like touch it because they're scared it's going to break or something is going to go wrong but the more you work with it the more like comfortable you become with changing it and like if something does go wrong you just I don't know like smash it in, into it and like cut a big piece out of it and like put it together in a different way and I think that kind of radical reimagining of the shape is what we we need in the world so i'm very for it as a medium especially like in the through a queer lens i think that is something that's important to me um i saw another comment here um would you like to read it out vanessa or you can read it as well if you want to otherwise i can read it if you can see it is from refiwe 
I think that's yes. that one. Yes, you're welcome to read it. Maybe it will be easier for you to answer if you read it also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it says, hello, Miro, while working on your first work shown, did you feel like you saw queer people interacting around a city as though the pieces represented people differently? Also, was ceramics the first thing that came to mind when studying art? So I'm not entirely sure if this was aimed at Ben um, because it was addressed to me. So I'm not sure. I'm sure that he may, uh, the person meant Ben. Um, so would you like to answer Ben? Um, okay. So yeah, when so I think I think you're saying that the the form or the forms together almost look like a city. Mm -hmm. I which, think that is. Yeah, that's a nice that's a nice point, and it it definitely does. The, actually, the next piece that I made um, now during my time here is more like city looking, more mm -hmm. architectural. But um, yeah, it makes sense because it it was about a community that existed in a particular city, and even like a community itself is like a city because, yeah, mm. I think that answers the question. I also have a point about like architecture and how it like causes people to react in certain ways because I did a reading a few years ago about how churches are built in a way to like inspire awe and there are other types of buildings that are specifically made to make people feel like unwelcome in certain spaces so there was like a it was a master's thesis about like how we can reimagine queer spaces to be more like encouraging queer people to come to those kind of spaces so um, a lot of the research was done around like smaller spaces like coffee shops where you can create like intimate nooks for people to like connect with and I think having like architecture as a reading into your work is important because it's almost like you're creating a city it's again with a utopian like um, reimagining it's like you can imagine a city or a space um, physically that you know queerness can exist in and um, it being very different to like the kind of the brutalist architecture that <laughs> the architecture that exists to kind of make certain people feel mm. like unwelcome um, when they enter those kind of spaces so I think that is an interesting reading of your work um, but actually it's something um, like I said for my next body of work I've been thinking about it's actually mm -hmm. something I've been exploring more like the infrastructure in a city and yeah. how infrastructure is almost like government or power guiding people through a space and i kind of want mm. to play with that and invert it to make a city that's more safe for queer people or like mm -hmm. a community. what does that what does the infrastructure look like sure that's really amazing can't wait to see it <laughs> Okay, we have another question. Um, actually, the, the city theme is putting through to this question as well. It's from um, Naipo. Um, may I say your ceramic pieces are amazing? Um, I agree with that. Uh, they're almost mm -hmm. like city buildings for queer individuals. My question is, how did people from the same sex learn about AIDS during the epidemic? The way media manipulates easily, does it really affect it? Not just um, the artist, but everyone and their social status? Um, I think, so I think you're referring to when the epidemic first started in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the government actually, in America particularly, they didn't acknowledge it at all. And so it was kind of up to the gay community to, to talk about it and, and fight for it to be acknowledged, which is why the that safe sex pamphlet was written that I was speaking about. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other part of the question was, um, yeah, how did, how did... Can I jump in quickly and yeah, say, yeah. Um, I think that as a contemporary reference, there's a series called It's a Sin um, that has to do with the um, AIDS epidemic and in, in the UK specifically and the way that um, a lot of people believed that it was like a hoax even people in the queer community thought that it wasn't real until it started affecting more and more of their friends and I think in that it really lays out quite well how um, like people 
banded together to create like information like Ben mentioned the pamphlet, but also there were like protests and like raising awareness events um, that were facilitated by like uh, uh, um, specifically like lesbian groups of women um, who would come together to like, I guess, look after and uh, raise awareness for gay men. So um, if you would like to find out more, I re highly recommend watching It's a Sin because it's not just, it's really well like produced and the acting is amazing, but it is also very informative and kind of details um, the struggles that young queer British people went through at the time where there was like no resources available and you could only rely on like each other, I guess, because the government wasn't doing anything to yeah. um, facilitate, you know, learning about it or destigmatizing it. So that's yeah, my recommendation. And also then thinking about how this, how history kind of repeats itself and something similar happened in South Africa during mm. our own AIDS epidemic um, where the government wouldn't acknowledge, or they would acknowledge that there was AIDS, but they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't give access to free medication or education programs or anything. So it was kind of up to people and like nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. and charities to kind of like help people um, get better. And yeah. by that point there were there was access to um, ARVs and different medications that you could take. But because there's so much misinformation from the media and government and also because of fear and stigma that's being created around this virus, people mm -hmm. are scared to even acknowledge if they if they might be positive, HIV positive. And so that's actually very dangerous. So I would say to everyone, you should, you should always just check. It's so simple to mm. have a test done. You can go to clicks and it's quick and easy. And mm -hmm. it's better to know than not to know. Yeah. It doesn't have to be such a scary thing. And yeah, you were saying history repeating itself. I think the whole um, what I was trying to bring up in the beginning, like with the monkeypox, um, yeah. you know, outbreak, it's almost like people are again not learning from their mistakes from 40 years ago and they're just this, the same media narrative is starting. And like, I think this time around, people are more aware of it, um, of the misinformation and are trying to like cut it yeah. off before it gets too rampant. But there are definitely parts of the world where that narrative is still being used as like a tool to discriminate against or like to discourage homosexuality or like queerness in general because I think people I, yeah I think there are certain structures that are more comfortable with queerness not existing so they'll obviously always try and find a yeah um, a way to make it seem like dangerous so it is something that affects everyone and it's close contact with people it doesn't have to be like sexual contact contact um you can like, you know, pick up monkeypox from just like any close contact. So I think it's something that needs to, the narrative around that also needs to change or, you know, become more clear. So. And it's also something that I saw during my research around fear. Mm -hmm. And when people are scared, they, they will cling to authority. So yeah. that, that almost gives authority and governments more power during these um, like, fearful times because they know yeah. they can they can use the fear of people to kind of create a an, a false narrative mm, i agree sure okay i think is there anything else on the yes we have a raised hand andre you are That's more than welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question uh thanks very much thanks Mira, for an excellent facilitation and thanks ben for your insights and excellent work um i'm just my question is around uh ceramics sort of in its broader concept is that you know um uh, throughout history um archaeologically it's um acted as an indicator for us for what happens in society or what's happened and mm. we make inferences from it as to how people may have lived and so I'm just wondering about your thoughts, Ben, around contemporary ceramics and what that indicator will be like. Um, what's the message that uh, we will put through about our socioeconomic status, about 
how we've interacted in society and then specifically like how would you like your work to uh you know if it's discovered in a thousand years like what what's the message that it's going to give and what will it be how what indicator will it be for the message that you're trying to bring through thanks thank you for that lovely question um i was actually reading in a book recently about everyone's like move towards ceramics that it's becoming this popular material and almost mm -hmm. like a bit trendy in a way and the person that was writing it kind of explained it as us as a as a society moving back to earth which i thought was quite beautiful and moving away mm -hmm. from materials like plastic which are discarded and not permanent so we kind of like moving back to something more permanent so mm -hmm. I'm, i think in a thousand years if people discovered all the ceramics that was made in the 20, 2020s maybe they would think that but for myself I, I wouldn't know what people would think maybe i guess um i my work is not so specific and it's it's like in relation to other sculptures which can be more like monumental and representing people with like with busts and and people's faces i think i'd like my work to be more um like sensitive and more open and fluid to to speaking about bigger community stories or something that's more fluid mm -hmm. i don't know if that answers the question um just yeah. to jump in oh sorry yeah go, go andre and then i'll jump in <laughs> no, i was i was just saying thank you that's fine mm -hmm. um ben i definitely agree with everything you were saying but i was just have i had this picture of someone finding a bunch of your sculptures in a thousand years and like um you were talking about like some like creating symbols or almost like um an alphabet and it would be really quite funny to me to like for people to infer like oh this is like a type of hier hieroglyphic or um a writing system developed mm -hmm. at some point because that's the thing we'd never know um what's going to like when we find things we don't know what they were used for. for a lot of the time we don't know what they were used for in that in their context so i think it's very funny to think what people might come up with um for your work specifically but i also think um imagine all the clay cafe like pieces that people are going to find in the thousand years and then what that's going to mean and what they're going to try and like um infer from that <laughs> because i think that like you said about it being trendy i think people find the access to those facilities that almost make it you know it's like step one step two step three of ceramics um makes it more accessible to people who aren't in the fine art world and i think that's a really good thing um it's almost like breaking down that barrier between like high art and like you know function like it's functional way but it's always been this exclusive thing or ex exclusionary thing and now anyone can go and i guess paint on something that they get at clay cafe yeah so i yeah would love to know what people think about those pieces in a thousand years <laughs> yes i think that would be very interesting <laughs> um <laughs> Okay, everyone, there's, um, we still have a few minutes left. So if you have a question, you're more than welcome to type it in the chat or just uh, put up your hand real quick. Um, otherwise, um, if there's no other questions, we will be slowly moving towards the end of the session. Uh, we'll just give a few seconds, just if anyone has a question, just to provide them with an opportunity to type it out quick. Let's see. Hey, Corin, <laughs> you're more than welcome to, to interject. <laughs> Corin? <laughs> you put up your hand, was that an accident? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Corin, we can't hear you if you're all talking. Um, I know I had technical difficulties before we got here. So <laughs> yeah, no, it's Corin experiencing the same, yeah. Um, okay, Corin, I'm going to just wait a few seconds. Um, let's see, I don't see anything in the chat. 
Okay, so if there are no further questions um, from my side, then, um, well, thank you for a very interesting session um, from a non-artist side. Um, that I must say, I found it quite interesting. And um, yeah, Miro, for asking great questions. Thank you very much. And um, for yeah. being, for sharing your expertise and your experience with us. Um, I think we are very privileged to, um, mm. to see your work and to, to learn more uh, about your mm. artists and in general and um, representing our country then Austria it's it's awesome um yes um let me just check again I don't see any questions okay so guys I think that is it for today um the next new breed art webinar will feature Johannesburg based Leshoka Joe Lehate um who is a lithographer and founder of LL Editions and Lorene Kuhn Botma uh, will be having a fascinating conversation with him also via zoom on the 29th of September also at four o'clock uh, so please Please join us and um, keep the, um, an eye on, on our new breed or social media platforms as well as the website for um, details on how to register. Um, and also uh, look for information on the Art Bank of South Africa's virtual workshop taking place in August, um, which is titled Professional Art Practice. This will be all about the business of art and how to build a thriving, sustainable career as artists. And we encourage you to join us for that as well. Okay, I will now be ending the session. Oh, there is a chat. Let us see. Oh, um, mm -hmm. Karen just saying thank you for a generous, inspiring conversation. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Mira, for the beautiful questions and all your lovely insights. And Vanessa for hosting us. It's been mm. awesome. I was also just going to say thank you to both of you for a very interesting time. And uh, Ben for agreeing to be interviewed. I really enjoyed this so much. So thanks again. Okay. Me too. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Have a good Thank evening. Travel safely back then. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay. Bye.